Let me uh, continue where I left, and uh, I guess what I will do is um, put my simulated experiment back on. Whoops, wrong one. <laughs> that should be that. <laughs> So we were, um, we were talking about this simulated experiment. As you recall, what we did was place a certain amount of liquid in a cylinder, fitted it with a free-to-move piston, exposed to a pressure on the outside that we could control, and then we slowly added heat to this system so that we would have a quasi-equilibrium process take place. And what we did then is um, take some data from the experiment, starting with the initial conditions. We started at room temperature, but at three different pressures uh, from the lowest here uh, to the highest, so the lowest pressure is the one on the right, and then uh, as you move to the left, then the pressure uh, goes up, the pressure that we can control, the pressure outside. And then uh, we slowly added uh, heat, as I say, down here, and then uh, we noted that the temperature would increase, the volume would increase, and eventually we would reach a point uh, denoted by the white circles, or the open circles, where vapor begin to, um, begins to form, and then the transition where the liquid is all converted to vapor, and then the open circles here on the right-hand side denoting when the last drop of liquid uh, disappears, and then eventually uh, we continue to heat up the gas. Uh, it's now all in the gas phase, so we continue to heat it up. So we developed this chart, and then I said, well, let's now join all the open circles on the left, which is where the vapor first appears, and then we call that the saturated liquid line. And then we did the same thing on the right-hand side, all the open circles where the liquid um, disappeared, the last drop of liquid, and then we call that the saturated uh, vapor line. And I told you that they meet at the top, and we call the uh, top where the two lines, the two red lines meet the critical point. And this is very typical with little uh, variations, but qualitatively speaking, this is pretty much the same for any substance. Um, we, we did it thinking that we were doing it for water, but you could do it for any other uh, substance and you would get something similar. Remember, we're pl plotting temperature versus volume, uh, but we also ended up with these blue lines, the dashed lines, which represent pressures, right? Because each of the dashed lines corresponds to a pressure at which we did that particular experiment. So the lowest of the three lines is the lowest pressure, then the middle pressure and the, and the high pressure. So we really have information on at least three properties. We have temperature on the vertical axis, volume on the horizontal axis, and then pressure along those um, blue lines. So if I just add a little bit more information, so if I, this is exactly the same um, diagram that I just redid it, but I put a little bit more data. Uh, I put data for water, put the numbers for water. So what's new here, let me shrink this a little bit. Uh, what's new here, I have now uh, the temperature scale in, in Celsius. So I put 20 Celsius down here, 100 Celsius here. And then I also put the volume. Note that what I have done here is I have actually written lowercase v. So this is actually specific volume. But in this problem, this is trivial because we started out with a certain amount of liquid water and that hasn't changed. The total mass as the liquid turns into vapor is always the same. There is no liquid escaping or vapor escaping the cylinder. So all I've done is divided by the mass 
to make it specific because this way it is more useful to us. Uh, but other than that, it's the same volume uh, uh, axis. It's just that now it's specific volume. Um, so I put some number here, 10 to the minus 3, uh, in cubic meters per kilogram, which is typical of liquid water. So, uh, so we have this, and then uh, again, the saturated liquid line, which was red in the original plot, but now it's black, and the saturated vapor line are the same. And the pressure lines, which were blue in the other diagram, are red here. But other than that, it is the same. I have added a fourth pressure line, so we have the low pressure, the middle pressure, and a high pressure. But I added a fourth one, which happens to be the one that goes right through the critical point, just so you would know what that is. And I gave some values. For example, uh, the middle pressure was uh, one atmosphere, if we were doing the experiment at one atmosphere pressure, then of course we would expect the water to start boiling at 100 Celsius. That's why there is 100 there. Um, if you do it at uh, 10 atmospheres, so 10 times the pressure of normal atmosphere, then of course this temperature would be higher. I didn't put the number here. Uh, but then you also have the pressure that corresponds to the uh, critical point, just so you have the value somewhere. And as you can see, it's 220 atmospheres. So that's how high the pressure would have to be for you to do the experiment and go through the critical point. Uh, two other pieces of information here is that I now added names to the, region, to the regions to the left of this bell-shaped uh, dome and to the right of this bell-shaped dome. So the region on the left is called subcool liquid or it can also be called compressed liquid. Those are equivalent names. Uh, Subcooled liquid or compressed liquid mean the same thing for us. Uh, so that's the region to the left of the dome, of the bell-shaped dome. And then the region to the right of it we call superheated vapor. So now we have two more names. So we got saturated liquid, uh, saturated vapor, compressed liquid, and superheated vapor. All right. Uh, okay, so um, what else could we do? Another thing that I could do here is uh, realize uh, that I could make another plot where I could plot either this graph or, or the previous one. Uh, I could plot, maybe let's go to the previous one because we have the open circles. I could make a plot of the uh, pressure at which the uh, first drop, I mean the first bubble of vapor forms for, for any given temperature. In other words, uh, at this uh, low temperature here, I could put this uh, temperature and plot it versus this pressure, whatever pressure corresponds to this line. And I could do it for all, all of them. So for example, if I come here, what I'm saying is that uh, for the ones that we have all the data, which would be say this one was a middle pressure experiment, that experiment was conducted at one atmosphere. So I could then make a plot of the temperature at which I first saw the vapor, which is of course 100 uh, Celsius. So at, at one atmosphere, I first saw vapor at uh, 100 Celsius. If I do it at 10 atmospheres, then of course it's a higher temperature. And if I do it at the lowest pressure here, which is not indicated, then of course it's a lower uh, temperature. So I can see that there is a correlation between pressure and temperature at which vapor first forms. And if I make that plot, it would look something like this. So now I am taking uh, temperature and putting it here on the horizontal line, on the horizontal axis, and pressure on the vertical axis. And then I make that correlation. For example, at one atmosphere, the vapor first form, or the evaporation, began at 100 Celsius. So that's that line. And I could do it for all the other cases. So if I go to the higher pressure, then of course I end up with a higher uh, temperature, and so on. So there is this curve that is related to this plot. There's obviously a connection between these two curves, but it's just two ways of looking at the data that came out of this experiment. All right, um, any questions before I keep going? 
Okay. Um, let me uh, define something then, because we have been talking about this water. I want to be very specific about the type of substances that we're looking at. So let me get this out of the way and give you a definition. What we call a pure substance in thermodynamics. So what we're going to be doing from now on is looking at thermodynamic calculations for what we define to be pure substances. And a pure substance is a very simple definition. For you to call a substance pure within the context of thermodynamics, that substance has to be homogeneous and in variable chemical composition. So homogeneous, of course, you all know what it means. It has to be the same everywhere. And the chemical composition must be the same everywhere. So with that in mind, is this here a pure substance in our experiment? Yes or no? Is it? Would you call this a pure substance? Why? It's just water. That's the best answer I can get. Uh, the fact that it goes through different uh, phases is not a problem because this liquid water is H2O and this water vapor is also H2O. So it meets our requirement that it be uh, the same uh, chemical composition, the same molecules. So what, water in that sense for us is a pure substance. Okay. If it doesn't have any other things in it that could um, uh, be different from place to place. Uh, and the other very important example for us would be air. We can treat air in our thermodynamic problems as a pure substance. Even though, of course, air is made up of different gases. But if you take that all of those gases will be the same everywhere, so if I put them in a cylinder, if I put air in a cylinder, as long as it is the same air everywhere with the same composition of different molecules, but the same everywhere, then I can treat it as a pure substance. And most of our problems will deal with water and air. Occasionally, we'll throw in some other substances just to make it interesting. For example, when we look at refrigeration, we'll have some refrigerants uh, as the substance. But again, we will be able to treat them as uh, pure substances. So water and air are uh, examples. So here is a, a little summary of our experiment, again, uh, on the right is the little schematic. We had the pure substance in the cylinder. We added heat to it. We controlled this pressure, P outside. And here is showing just two examples, one at a low pressure, P1, and another one at a high pressure, P2. And then, of course, I have the T sat, the saturation temperature corresponding to P1 and the saturation pressure corresponding to P2, Tsat2, which is nothing again but uh, uh, reiterating this curve, right? that I can always link a pressure to a saturation temperature. So two more um, definitions, which are kind of obvious from what we just said. Uh, saturation temperature is the temperature at which vaporization occurs at a given pressure. That's saturation temperature. Again, that has to do with this graph. So if I choose a pressure, for example, one atmosphere, and I ask you, what is the saturation uh, temperature corresponding to one atmosphere, then you tell me 100 degrees Celsius. But I can also ask you the question the other way around. And then, of course, then that defines something that is uh, called saturation pressure. So if I ask you, what is the saturation pressure at 100 Celsius, then you tell me one atmosphere. So it's just the same thing, but depending on which value you go in first. You can either tell me the temperature and I tell you what the pressure is, or the other way around. So then saturation pressure is the pressure at which vaporization occurs at a given temperature. The point that we're trying to emphasize is that these two properties are linked 
at the moment of vaporization. There is a link. When vaporization occurs at a given pressure, there is a link to a temperature and, 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 vice, and, and back and forth the same, the same thing. All right. Okay, so let's uh, add more data to our um, plot. And in fact, this is a little bit, rather than being uh, handmade, this is uh, computer generated. So here is uh, more data for, for water. Uh, again, specific volume, as I had in the hand, in the second hand sketch, temperature in Celsius. Here is, I also had that one, one atmosphere, right? But this time I write one atmosphere as uh, 1.014 bars, or 14.7 PSI. So that's the pressure of one atmosphere. We know that the temperature, the saturation temperature for one atmosphere is 100 Celsius. So it's 100 Celsius, or 212 Fahrenheit. And of course, here's another one at 10 um, megapascals. And here is the 22 megapascals, which is the 220 uh, atmospheres that correspond to uh, critical pressure. So not a lot new there. Now, what happens in here, in this, uh, inside this bell-shaped region? Remember, we said uh, vapor first appears when we hit the left side of this bell-shaped dome and the last drop of liquid uh, disappears when I hit the right-hand side of this bell-shaped dome. So what happens when I am in between? Well, when I am in between means, of course, in terms of uh, what the picture looks like, it's like the middle picture here. So while, while I am in a situation where I have both liquid and vapor, then, of course, that means that I am in between here, in between the, in, inside this, uh, this bell. So, but, but where exactly am I? Well, obviously, when I just have a little bit of uh, vapor, I am closer to the left side. And when I have just a little bit of liquid left, then I am uh, closer to the right-hand side. But if I just give you a pressure and a temperature, you wouldn't be able to tell me where exactly we are inside. Right? Think about that for a second. Suppose I tell you, you have water at 100 Celsius, one atmosphere. Where are we in the dome? What would be your answer? Suppose I ask you that question. 100 Celsius, one atmosphere, another guy behind you. You answered many questions last time. so. I'm going to leave you alone. So what do you think? Can, would you be able to, in fact, I, I already gave you the answer. Would you be able to tell me, here is 100 Celsius and one atmosphere, would you be able to tell me where we are between F and G? You can't, because you could be as close to G as, as close to F as possible or as close to G as possible, depending on how much vapor or how much liquid you have. So the way we resolve that problem, and remember, it has to do with the fact that the temperature and the pressure are linked inside the dome. So the way you answer that question, to say uh, how much of it we have, here is again a uh, handmade uh, sketch. Nothing new here, saturated liquid, saturated vapor, compressed liquid, superheated vapor, uh, liquid with a no with F. So when we are in this region, you saw that already here for the first time. You saw that there is an F there and a G there. That's because those are the symbols or the subscripts that we use for liquid and vapor. So F is the liquid, uh, G is the vapor. That's just because traditionally that's what we have been using in thermodynamics. So that's the only new piece of information that you have here. Liquid, F, vapor, G. But how do I determine where I am? For that, you need another piece of information. And that other piece of information is called the quality. So quality in thermodynamics has a very specific meaning different from quality 
in the world, okay? whether you know, something is good or bad. Uh, quality in thermodynamics, for which we use the symbol X, simply means the ratio of the mass of vapor yeah, to the total mass. And that solves the problem because I'll come back to the equation. If I am here with a mixture of liquid and vapor and I don't know exactly where I am, I can solve the problem by knowing or by somebody telling me how much mass is vapor compared to the total mass. So if uh, I know that, then I know the quality and that exactly tells me then where to be in that region, whether I'm closer to the F or closer to the G. And of course, uh, the total mass, the only thing I have done in the second side of the equation is, the second expression here, is to write that the total mass is the sum of the liquid mass and the vapor mass. Mm -hmm. So that's the quality. Notice that I wrote here in red and I put a, uh, I highlighted dome. This, is, this definition is only valid in the dome region. So we don't speak about quality if we have a compressed liquid or a superheated vapor because there is no need to talk about quality there. This is all liquid, no question about it. Over here, this is all vapor. Those have names, compressed liquid, superheated vapor. It's only when I have a mixture of saturated liquid and saturated vapor that I talk about quality. So that's what the quality is. It's just that ratio. Uh, mass of the vapor divided by the total mass. Therefore, what is the quality uh, if I, all I have is saturated liquid? Zero. And what is the quality if all I have is saturated vapor? One. So, very simple. Sometimes we refer to quality as a percentage. So we say uh, the quality is one, or we can also say 100% if the quality is, uh, I mean, if, there's, if, if we are completely vapor in, on the saturated vapor line, then we say one or 100% quality. Okay, uh, now what can I do with this um, uh, quality information? Notice that I plotted here, again, temperature versus specific volume. Right? This is specific volume. But what, one thing that I can do is I can write an equation for the volume. And let me take you through this. Uh, this is the total volume. Obviously, the total volume is the volume occupied by the liquid plus the volume occupied by the vapor. You can see that here again. So all I'm saying is that this total volume inside this cylinder is whatever volume the liquid occupies plus whatever volume the vapor occupies. So that's it. I just add that. Now, what am I doing here? Then from the definition of specific volume, right? remember, specific volume is volume over mass. So all I'm doing here is I am writing this volume as the product of the specific volume of liquid times the mass of liquid plus doing the same thing for the vapor. So the total volume of vapor is the specific volume of the vapor times the mass of the vapor. So I can have that. And then if I now divide by the mass, move that up. If I now take that and divide by the total mass, m sub t, then of course I have the specific volume, lowercase v. And if you just uh, divide by mass both of these terms, the first term is mf over mt, the second term is mg over mt. Of course, mg over mt is the quality, so I put an x there, and mf over mt is also obviously 1 minus the quality. So I come up with this handy relationship between the specific volume of the mixture of the entire system as a function of the specific volume of the liquid and the specific volume of the vapor. And the only other piece of information that I need to do that calculation is the quality. So knowing the quality and the specific volumes of the liquid and the vapor, I can find the specific volume of the entire system, and I can then put a number here on whatever value that specific volume is as I go through the process. All right, so 
This will be probably one of the formulas that you'll use, one of those that you'll use a lot. And we'll extend it later to other properties for the time being. We're just going to use it for volume. But as you can see, it's very easy to understand where it comes from, just from the definition of quality. Any questions? Okay. I guess I should show you this one too. This is the same thing. So again, this is a plot of this is a plot of temperature versus specific volume, the same one we have been looking at. Uh, you can see the bell-shaped region in blue, the critical point at the very top. Uh, saturated liquid on the left side, saturated vapor on the right side. There is also a label here for superheated vapor. And then uh, quality, X equals zero on the left side. Quality equals one on the saturated side. And then VF, right, the specific volume of the liquid is always here. The specific volume of the vapor is always here. And it introduces a new quantity that we use a lot when we're solving problems, which is V sub FG. V sub FG is nothing but the difference between these two volumes, the specific volumes. So if you take the specific volume of the vapor and then subtract the specific volume of the liquid, you get what we denote VFG. V sub FG, we just call it VFG for short. So that's, that's what this uh, figure uh, introduces for you. Okay. Um, so far, we have only been talking about liquid and vapor. But what about solid? Even though we won't really do any significant work involving solid, because for what we need to do in this thermodynamics class, it's plenty to just work with liquid and vapor, it is good for you to know um, where the solid picture is in all of this. So, of course, the way we did the experiment, it was in such a way that um, all we had was liquid and vapor because we started out with liquid and we started heating it. But, uh, of course, where would solid be on a picture like this? And, uh, in fact, uh, if we go back to this one, okay, this is our relationship between pressure and temperature right, for, at the saturation line. Um, we, of course, know that this right here is what? Say that again? The critical point. Right? This here is a critical point because if I think about what I'm doing for this, chart is finding that or correlating the temperatures and the pressures and as I go up at some point I'm going to hit the critical point so that critical point is right there. Now there is another point down here if I were to lower the pressure instead of increase the pressure if I were to lower it at some point I would hit something which is this point right here. Does anybody know what that is? Hmm? No, it's not absolute zero. Way before absolute zero. The triple point, very good. So down here we would find the triple point, and what is the triple point? Yeah, where you can have all three together. The solid, the liquid, and the vapor happily live together. Um, so if I do that, then in this plot, what I would be doing is I would, you know, this is what I showed you so far. Right? Uh, bell shape, compressed liquid, saturated vapor, liquid and vapor, critical point. But if I go down, then I would hit a line here that is called the triple line. And of course, in this plot, it is a point. But on this view, it is actually a line. Because I could have 
all kinds of different specific volumes, all the way from the saturated, saturated liquid to the saturated vapor, I could have different values of the specific volume depending on how much I have of each. So that's why it, should, it looks like a line here. Then below that line, what we have is, instead of having liquid and vapor, which is what we have here in the upper side of the bell, down here we have solid and vapor. Right. And of course here to the left, I didn't mark it, but you would have solid. So solid, uh, solid and vapor, and then vapor always on the right hand side. So that's just so you know, like I said, we're not really going to dwell on uh, systems that have solid in them, uh, but so you know where things are. Now, what are those values for water? It's not absolute zero. What is the triple line temperature? What? Uh, very close. <laughs> very close. It's actually one, 0 0.01. Let me shrink this a little bit. 0 0.01 Celsius. And of course, there is a pressure that corresponds to it. So you, you must have both to be at the triple line. If you just take water and take it to 0 0.01 Celsius, all you have to do is take, put it in your freezer. But of course, the pressure in your freezer is what? Huh? One atmosphere. So you won't get the three happily. Uh, coexisting, you need to bring the pressure down uh, to 0.6 kilopascals to be really at the triple line. So if you do that, then you would be at the triple line. Uh, so here's a more complete uh, picture of the whole thing. So here I, what I have done is I have added some of these other lines. Uh, so, uh, temperature versus specific volume, the bell shape that we were looking at earlier, now we also see the triple line and we see more lines there. Now, take a look at this note that I wrote here on the right hand side because I wrote here, this is for a substance that contracts upon freezing. So, could this be water? No. So, this is not for water, but it's for a substance that contracts upon freezing. But this is what the other lines would, would look like. So S for solid, L for liquid, and V for vapor, and you can see all of the regions for a substance that contracts upon freezing. Um, so the real story, and I should actually give you Another, well, um, yeah, let me, let me show you this first and then I'll give you another definition. Uh, so the real story is that the picture actually <coughs> looks like this. Now that, not that this is now a 3D plot. But there's nothing new here, other than we have made a 3D plot. Uh, so, now, so we have three axes. So everything that we were doing before, we either had two axes, like for example, if we do this plot, we have temperature and specific volume, or when we did this one, we had pressure and temperature. So. All along, we have been dealing with three properties, pressure, temperature, and specific volume. So I could put them all in one three-dimensional plot, and that's what this is. So here you have the pressure on the vertical axis, the volume on the horizontal axis, and the temperature on the axis that will be perpendicular to the paper, but in this 3D, in this projection, of course, it's angle, but you can see it, that it's just that would be the one normal to the paper. And you can see there the region of the bell-shaped dome, the liquid and vapor region is right there. The triple line, you can see it right there. And you can see kind of what this is. Let me try to put both together so you can see the one above and the one below. So if we see this, 
we can then recognize that this two-dimensional one that is temperature versus volume is nothing but a projection of this three-dimensional surface on a plane. So from which angle should I be looking at this to see that? Say that again. Louder. Top. Above. From above, right? From above. So if I look at this from above, so if I'm looking at this from above, I see that. Right? Convince yourself that that's, that that's the case by looking at it for a long time. Uh, but of course, I can also look at it from the front. If I look at it, let's go back for a second. If I look at it, like you're saying, from above, then of course the pressure axis is perpendicular to me, so I just see a point, right? So for, the, for that axis. Right? If I look at it from above, so to see temperature versus volume, then the pressure axis would be sticking out of the paper like that. Right? Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't see the pressure lines because you can see them right there. You can see it here in green, for example. That constant pressure line that you can see in green, it's kind of hard to see in the dark portion here, but it comes right here cuts across, then cuts across the dome, and then goes off that way. Right? When I see that from above, as we are suggesting, we of course see these lines, these blue lines. Right? So these blue lines here are the constant pressure lines, which is nothing but of course like slicing this three-dimensional surface with a plane at a fixed pressure. Right? So if I slice this with a plane at a constant pressure, then of course that's what I see, what I have above there. And of course I can also view it like I was saying, if I view it now from this angle, so if I view it from here, then now the temperature is the one that is, the temperature axis is a point for me. And then, of course, I would be slicing this with planes that produce these lines. You can see here, constant temperature line. Let me blow this up. Right. Constant temperature line. You can see now this dashed line. That is a slice at constant temperature. And uh, what does that look like? Well, I'll show you in another one uh, in a little bit. Now, this is for this type of a substance, like I wrote here. This is for a substance that contracts upon freezing. It looks like that. You can see how when you freeze it, the volume goes down. So the volume just keeps contracting. What would a substance like water look like? Because water expands when it freezes. So what happens is that if you look at the three-dimensional surface for something like water, then it looks like this. You see how it has this back kink? Because actually now when you go from liquid water to solid water, say at one atmosphere, the volume actually increases. That's why the ice floats on the water. Um, <clears throat> so that is represented in the three-dimensional plot by that backward surface that, that, that is hidden to us. Right? You can see here the solid and liquid surface is actually hidden from us, is behind that kink. Right? That's, that's the difference between something like water and this one, which for example, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, which contracts when it, um, when it freezes, it looks like this. Any questions? Okay, uh, let me see, let me check time here. Okay, um, let me ask you a question. So if you get, um, before I move on here, um, let me ask you a quick question, and this is just really going to be a test. So get your eye clickers ready. And um, let's see. 
There we go. Let me, um, and I'll just give you, I think you probably need maybe 15 seconds to answer this question. Uh, and stay quiet. The idea is that you don't tell your friends what the answer is. Oh, hold on, I have to put the uh, computer. Yeah, that should be it. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so, answer that question. I'll give you five more seconds. Give you a couple more. Okay, I'm going to stop it. All right, so let's see what happened. What is the correct answer? This is uh, when I was playing with this stuff uh, the other day. This is like um, when you poll the audience, right? Your, your lifeline, poll the audience. That usually gets it right. And that's the case here. So that's the correct answer. A closed system is one for which, let me move this out of the way. Let me close here. However, notice how almost 30% of you thought it was D. Right? No energy or mass crosses the boundary. What type of a system is that? No energy or mass crosses the boundary. Isolated. isolated system, right? That's an isolated system. So, all right, that was fun. Um, let me go back to the uh, document camera. And keep going with this. <clears throat> Is it there? Yeah. Okay, so here's more of the same. Uh, here is that, uh, the same uh, three-dimensional figure that I just showed you that had color. It's again shown here, but without the additional color. So you can again see how, this is water. So you can see how that surface, the solid liquid surface, is hidden. It's behind that, behind that kink in the three-dimensional surface. Uh, as I said earlier, for us, most of the problems, if not all of the problems, will be dealing with liquid and vapor. So we're really going to be talking about problems that where if there is a phase change, it will be going through the uh, orange colored uh, dome, right? So and it will be above the triple line and below the critical point. We might do some problems where we're actually above the critical point. You can do an experiment like as you saw, you have to be above 220 atmospheres if you do it for water. Uh, to, to go to actually do the experiment above critical point. In which case, of course, you don't go through the dome because you're above it. Uh, so you, it will happen somewhere up here. And here is uh, two of the projections that we have seen so far. This one is nothing but the one that I showed you earlier in blue. So this plot, pressure versus temperature, the so-called saturation curve, the vapor pressure curve, uh, is, of course, this one here going from the triple point to the critical point. So that is that curve. We were only looking at a portion of it when we saw this. Remember, we concluded that this was the triple point. So there is the triple point. And here you see that line that represents that kink in the back. Right? That's the solid liquid um, curve, uh, solid liquid pressure curve. And then, of course, you have solid vapor. You can go from solid to vapor, from solid to liquid, or from liquid to vapor. And uh, here's uh, the same. This is the view, the pressure versus temperature view um, that shows the temperature lines as they come down like this. Right? So when you're plotting a pressure versus specific volume plot, and you're putting your liquid vapor region in the dome, and you want to represent constant temperature lines, they actually come down from left to right. Okay. So that's one thing for you to remember in the course, that when you do the pressure specific volume plot, 
you put the dome, your constant temperature lines come down from left to right, which is different from what the constant pressure lines look in the temperature volume plot, which is the one that I have been showing you earlier, for example, this one. right? So if I do temperature versus volume, that. If I do temperature versus volume, I have the dome, my constant pressure lines go up from left to right. When you do um, pressure volume plots, then the constant temperature lines come down from left to right. That's one important thing to remember uh, when you're solving problems and you're doing schematics and so on. Okay. Um, all right. So. We have all this information in, in the form of plots. Temperature, pressure, specific volume. But when we're solving problems, we need numbers. So if I'm solving a problem and I need to find, say, the final volume of the, say, suppose I'm doing this problem, the same one we have been looking at. I'm doing, I give you this problem, I tell you I give you a certain amount of water, I'm going to heat it up, and I tell you I'm going to heat it up to a certain temperature, tell me what the final volume is going to be. How much volume will I need? How tall should this cylinder be so that uh, you know I still have all of my mass inside? That could be a typical problem. So I actually need data. Uh, so how do I get that data? Well, nowadays uh, you can actually also get it, uh, you know, online computer. You know, you, I, I don't know. If, has anybody bought the text? And has the, does the text have a disk? Anybody bought it? It doesn't have a CD. It's okay. You don't need it. It's just that I read somewhere that in the, in, in the text I have that it says that this book comes with a CD, but I don't think it's true. Uh, but anyway, you can go online. There are some websites that will give you some of the data for free and some for which you have to pay. You know? So they give you a little bit of data, but then if you really want all of the data, then of course you have to pay because people want to make money. Um, but there are programs like that that you can input the data that you have, and it'll spit out the data that you need. So now what we need is another piece of information here. You might remember last time I asked you, how many properties do I need to define the state of a system? You remember that question. Uh, we were talking about, you know, so I want you to define the system completely and exactly, no doubts as to where we are. How many properties do we need? And I made the analogy to the names. I said, you know, how many properties do I need for each of you in order to identify you? And we said, well, maybe first and last name is enough. So I forget which name I use as the example. But if I just give a first name, I'll probably have a few hands. If it's a common name, I'll have a few hands up. If I say first name and last name, chances are that I'll just get one person. But if it's a very large class, 2,000 people, that might not be enough. So you might need another one. You might need first name, middle name, last name. That might not even be enough, you, you know, depending on the size of your sample. But for us in thermodynamics, the question is, for a system in a certain state, how many properties do I need to define that state? And some people knew the answer. Does anybody? Or some people were guessing at the answer. How many? He thinks it's three. What do you think? Take a wild guess. More than, three. Huh? More, than three. More than three. So four. So I would need maybe first name, middle name, last name, and address or something. I don't know. So four. Anybody else? Let's see. Is that person asleep there on the back? No. <laughs> Leave him alone. How about in front of him? He's asleep, so we won't bug him. What, how many? Three. So three, three, four. Let's see, last person there. Three. Because okay, he knows a lot. So he actually gave us extra information. <laughs> he said two, which is correct. Right? So the correct answer is two. But he added something that is very important. He said they have to be independent. They actually have to be intensive. That's another qualifier. So uh, that's known as the state postulate. So the state postulate is essentially telling us how many properties we need. So 
This is for a pure substance. We also call it a simple compressible system. This is a fancy name. Uh, really what it means is that we should, we're talking about a system that is not affected by anything external that might make things a little bit uh, different. For example, we talked about the effect of gravity. Right? Gravity has an effect because it, if you have gravity and you have liquid, then the pressure changes because of the presence of gravity. So when we're thinking of a simple compressible system, pure substance, we're thinking of that substance not being affected by any external agents that might change things around. So if we have such a thing, then the state is defined by two, uh, that's important, the answer was two, independent and intensive properties. So they have to be independent and they have to be intensive. You all know what intensive means, right? He knows. Right? So intensive means what? Independent of the mass. So if I ask you to throw examples at me, for a system in equilibrium, temperature, pressure, specific volume, those are the only three that we have really talked about in, at any length, but you could throw other things, specific internal energy. So they have to be intensive, independent of mass. But they also have to be independent. And what does that mean? Well, that they should not depend on the other. And there is really only one situation that we have to be concerned with that. What do you think that is? That the independence of the two properties is not there. We talked about it today. When? That is correct, but when? Always? When you're inside the dome. All right? So temperature and pressure, when we are inside the dome, are not independent. What is the dependence? It's right there. If I am inside the dome and I give you a pressure, you are able to tell me at the temperature back. So if I say we're inside the dome at one atmosphere, I don't have to tell you the temperature. You can tell me what the temperature is. You go up to this graph and you really say it's 100 Celsius. Huh? So pressure and temperature are not independent when you are inside the dome. So anywhere else for us in our liquid vapor world, and in our liquid vapor world, I don't want to show this one. Well, I guess I'll show this one. If I'm over here, for example, if I have superheated vapor, so, and I give you pressure and temperature, I say, this is the pressure, this is the temperature. If it happens to be superheated, that's all you need. You can actually come here and put a dot somewhere, wherever that pressure and that temperature exist. So, but if I tell you 100 Celsius, one atmosphere, put a dot here, put a dot on this graph at 100 Celsius, one atmosphere, you can't. You have, you have a whole line from F to G. Could be anywhere there. So what else can I give you then for you to really identify the state if you're inside the dome? Which volume? Who's that volume? Somebody over here. Specific volume, right? Because remember, they have to be intensive, so specific volume. Or if I give you the volume, then I also have to give you the mass, so you can get the specific volume. Can I give you something else? I don't want to give you the specific volume. Quality. quality. So if I give you, say, for example, the temperature and the quality, you're all set. Or if I give you the pressure and the quality, you're all set. Because the quality is a property. Quality is, in fact, an intensive property. So you can add it to our list. Temperature, pressure, specific volume, quality. Specific uh, volume and quality as four uh, intensive independent, independent properties. Okay, so that's that. So now, where is the data? So again, if you... 
If you have access to a program that can give you the data, then that's fine. Uh, you would enter two. So if you go to any of those programs online, and I was checking a few online, but you don't need to. I mean, you, we're not going to do problems that way because you won't have access to the data when you're, say, taking an exam uh, online. But, uh, but you can. And so you enter two, and the program tells you everything else. It tells you this is, this is all the other data. For us, what we have is, if you take your text and you go to Appendix B, it looks like this. <laughs> Bunch of numbers. It looks like that. That's a sample of what Appendix B looks like. It's a lot of numbers, all right? So, um, Appendix B is uh, thermodynamic tables. You can see that there. And all you need to do is to learn how to use them. So, uh, they're all in Appendix B. And I'll show you some examples. Let me actually show you how the data... Oh, let me actually show you this one first. This is all of the appendices that you have. All right, you have six, B1 through B6. And those are the substances that you have data for in your text. By far, we'll use water the most, appendix B1, but you have ammonia, B2, we have CO2 in B3. These two are refrigerants. R410A and R134A are refrigerants. You have tables for those, B4 and B5. And then you have um, nitrogen in B6. So those tables, B1 through B6, have the data that you need for problems that involve uh, phase change. Liquid, for us, most, most importantly, liquid to vapor. But there's also some solid data there. Uh, so let me show you what, uh, for example, for the water. So the B1 table is actually divided into a bunch of subtables. So, and each of the regions are represented here. So you can see where they are. So if you go, for example, to Appendix B1, which is for water, you have actually B11, B12, B13, and B14, and B15. But as I said, this is solid. This is below the triple line, so we won't worry about that. You really have to learn to work with B11, B12, B13, and B14. And you can see where they are, exactly. Um, let's start with the ones that are uh, outside the dome. So B14 is compressed liquid. Uh, B13 is uh, superheated vapor. And then, as you can see, inside the dome, we have two tables. We have B11 and B12. It's really the same table. It's really the same table. The difference is that it depends on what you have to begin with. So if you have temperature, for example, as your primary piece of data, then you would go to B11. So let me actually show you what are we doing here? Um, where do I have that? I have uh, I should have a printed B11 here somewhere. So B1, now that I need it, otherwise I'll just use the text, but uh, B11, B21, B1. Ah, here we go, B11. So if your primary piece of information is temperature, then you go to B11. Let me blow this up so we can see what we have here. So if you know the temperature, you go to B11 because the temperature entry here is all divided into nice intervals. So 0 0.01, remember that's the triple point. So that's the triple uh, temperature. And then you go 5, 10, 15 in increments of 5 degrees, I'm sorry, right there. 
And what the second column tells you is the pressure that corresponds to that temperature. So what the first two columns are doing for you is they are giving you my same blue curve. They're giving you this correlation. Right? So if you go in with the temperature, you can read the pressure that corresponds to that. So in fact, let's look at 100 Celsius. Go down here to 100 Celsius. 101 kilopascals, which is one atmosphere. So it gives you that. So temperature, pressure, and then it gives you, for, for the time being, we're just going to worry about the next three columns, which is the specific volume. It gives you the specific volume of the saturated liquid. Skip one. The next one is the specific volume of the saturated vapor, V sub G. So it's giving you these two volumes at a certain temperature is giving you the volume on the left side of the dome and the volume on the right side of the dome. So it's telling you what the vapor, where the liquid volume is, what the vapor volume is. And the column in between those two is our VFG that I defined earlier. So it's only the difference between the two numbers. Right? So that's what it is. Now, the tables will have other columns that we'll learn as we go along. But for the time being, you can stop there at the, uh, uh, just the specific volume uh, data. So that's B11. If you do B12, it's the same table as I said, but with the pressure first. So let me look at a B12. And I have this one, for example. This is so you can see how these are switched. So now the pressure is first, the temperature is uh, the second one. Because that's if you have the pressure, then it's easier to go into this one. If you happen to have a round number for the pressure, then you can go here, read the temperature, and the same three columns afterwards for specific volume, specific a specific volume of the liquid, specific volume of the vapor, and the difference between the two. That's how the tables work in the region inside the bell, inside the dome, B11 and B12. Questions? Let's look at um, the superheated vapor, so B13. So here, right? So if I am out here, then I don't have that link between pressure and temperature. So if I am out there, here's a nice sketch. So for example, suppose that I give you a certain temperature and a certain pressure. So whatever value here, and I give you so one of these pressures. Suppose I give you the P2 value. So you come with your temperature, draw a horizontal line until you intersect that pressure. That's where we are. So of course, what the table could give you right away, if you know the temperature and the pressure, is it could give you the volume of that gas, of that vapor. That's essentially what the table does. Uh, the way it does it is it's divided into subtables. So if I look at B13, if I look at B13, that's a random page between, I mean, inside table B13, is really divided into subtables. So in this page, for example, there are four subtables. And each subtable is for a different pressure. So we'll have, for example, this is a very high pressure. It's 5,000 kilo, 5, kilopascals, or 5 megapascals, 6 megapascals, 8 megapascals, 10 megapascals. So each one of these subtables is looking at a different pressure line. So for example, let's say that this is uh, 5 megapascals. Then the next one would be, on the tables, it would be 6 megapascals and then maybe 8 megapascals, for example. So it's just giving you those pressures. And then as you go down, so let's focus on one of the subtables. It's like the first one, which is 5 megapascals. We're looking at, say, this, let's say that this is 5 megapascals, this pressure P1. Then the table is going from here, from the saturation, from the saturation line, out. 
to some high temperature. So you can see that here. That's why the first entry of each subtable always says SAT, SAT, because that's telling you the saturation value. Let me blow this up to this um, subtable. So look, that's also giving you another piece of information here. At 5,000 kilopascals, it has a temperature in parentheses. What is that temperature? What do you think that temperature is? Saturation. saturation. It's a saturation temperature that corresponds to that pressure. In the graph, what does that mean? That is giving me this temperature that I would read right here for saturation temperature corresponding to this pressure. It's giving, it's giving me that number there if I want it. And then as I go down from that saturation point, so this very first line here, this very first line is right on the saturation line. So it's giving me the specific volume and some other properties that we don't need to worry about yet. But they are internal energy, enthalpy, and entropy. For the time being, I just need that volume. So it's just giving me, to begin with, this volume, this volume right here. And then as I move this way, I'm increasing the temperature. So as I go down here, as I go down here, I'm going up in temperatures. So remember, we start at 263.9, so 264, and then 300, 350, 400, all the way to 1300. That's how the superheated table works in this B13. B14 is more or less the same, but now going to the other side. So table B14 which is for the compressed liquid, is now taking you from the saturated liquid line down that way. But it operates, like I said, it operates um, in the same way. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, why don't I ask you another question before I... Uh, move on here. Uh, so I want to come here. I don't want to show you that yet. <laughs> okay, here's another one for you to think about. Um, <clears throat> Do this right the first time. Okay. Okay, I started the time. I'm going to stop it in 10 or 15 seconds. Normal conditions, one atmosphere, 300 Kelvin. What is the weight of one meter cube of water? Okay? All right, I'm going to stop it. What is the answer? Ask the audience. <laughs> okay, so 55% um, got the right answer. So it's good. Again, most of you. Uh, more than half of you. Uh, <clears throat> those are some of those simple numbers that I think you should have in your head. Uh, <clears throat> so look how many of you think it's only a kilogram. That means that I could carry a cubic meter of water and a little sack on my back. Right? <clears throat> but it's actually a, a thousand kilograms. Right? A, thousand. a cubic meter of water is a lot of water. Right? One meter cubed. Uh, so, again, that's um, just so you get to become familiar with those um, terms. Let me see if I, um, yeah, I still have a little bit of time. So, let me uh, walk you through one of the problems. So, let's go back here to the... 
One of your homework problems is actually just for you to practice um, using the tables. So let's just maybe walk to maybe one or two of these. So here is the first one. So it has, it's a problem 227. It has uh, four parts. It's just asking you to determine the state. And of course, by that we mean, well, give us another property. So we're going to give you two properties. There should be enough for you to determine the state. Um, you know what? What is the state? So here is um, here's the first one. Is uh, we give you pressure and specific volume. So the pressure is 10 megapascals. The specific volume is 0 0.003 cubic meters per kilogram. And of course, I'm kind of giving you the. But suppose you don't have that piece of information there. Well, actually, that's probably OK. So you're given that. What do you do? How do you find the missing properties? Let's say, for example, that we want to know the temperature. What is the temperature? So how do I do this? Um, well, the part of the hint is, of course, right there. Since we are given pressure, and we have no idea at this point where we are, could be anywhere. But we're given the pressure and the volume, of course. One thing we can do is we can check in the dome to see whether we might be inside the dome. And what do I mean by that? Well, it says uh, 10 megapascals. And I, so I have to go to the pressure table, which is B12, with the one I show you. And um, I don't know if I have. I may. So I'll just use the text. So I go to B12 at 10 megapascals. That's actually not so bad. So here is B12. In fact, this is the very beginning of B12. Remember, it starts from the triple line, or the triple point, which is right here, 0.6, remember? 0.6 um, kilopascals, 0 0.01. And all I need to do is go down to the pressure that was given to me, which was 10. Uh, well, it was 10 megapascals. So we have to be careful. It's not, this is 10 kilopascals. So 10 megapascals is going to put me uh, at 10,000 kilopascals. So it's going to put me down here. Oops. 10,000. Right? 10 megapascals. So what do I see here? Well, I can, see the, I can see what the temperature would be if I were in the dome. Right? How do I know if I'm in the dome or not? Because I have that other piece of data. I have the specific volume, which was 0 0.003 cubic meters per kilogram. So here I am at 10, um, move that up, 10 um, megapascals, 10,000 kilopascals. And what do I check to see if I am in the dome or not? Exactly. The same thing you guys are saying. I need to see if my specific volume is in the range. What is the range? Well, from the liquid volume, which is 0 0.0014, to the vapor value, skip one column, which is 0 0.01. 03. And what was my number? 0 0.003. So I am in that range, right? I am in that range. So now that I know that I am in the range, I could do what? I could say, well, the temperature is indeed 311.6 Celsius. Don't forget to give units. <laughs> when you're solving problems, don't just give me a number. Don't forget your units. It'll cost you. So uh, 311.1, if you want to round, it's fine, um, Celsius. And then what else could I give, or what else can I ask you to give me? Huh? The quality. You know, you should be able now to get the quality with this information. How do you get the quality? Well, you might go back a few pages, right? 
you have an expression that connects the quality and the specific volumes. Right? We worked it out about an hour ago. Right? So you go back to that and then you can get the quality. You can back out the quality from that um, expression. So uh, there are more, so do, do that as a practice. Uh, you know, work them all out and then um, see how you're doing. If not, the discussion section, the TA will go over more of these. All right, so I will see you on um, Thursday.